The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg. Hey everybody, the this is Let's Greg with the Brothers right Wish, number 77. Uh, I'm here in the motherland, Texas, College Station to be exact. Uh, up to my left is Captain Dave. Where are you from, Dave? I'm from L.A. Oof. Oof. Here, this is the intro song. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Some <laughs> awful song from the 90s that we love. Oh, much like yourself. Hey, oh. Mikey. <laughs> Mikey from <laughs> Chicagoland. Say hi. How's it going? Hey. I hear all of the people saying, it's going great, Mike. Thanks, dude. Uh, let's see. Let's get all of the uh, the good stuff out of the way. Uh, another uh, cast sponsored by Sonar, Scalable, Intuitive, Comprehensive ISP Billing and Operational Support System. Learn more at sonar.software. Uh, but we, yeah, like I said before, in our private Slack, we do have a Sonar channel that's actually got some, I don't know that anybody's an expert on it, but we got some pretty knowledgeable guys in there. And they're constantly tossing back new stuff. And when new features come out, they're discussing it. A lot of good discourse on there. I, I dig it. Uh, let's see, what else? New patrons. I mentioned uh, patrons a second ago. We have a Patreon-only Slack Oh, uh, and it's getting strong, man. A lot of good people in there. Our new patrons this week are Chad Wax, Jeff Schaff, Schaefer, uh, Rizwan Merchant, Will Deer, Damien, or uh, um, Damien Arangi, I think, and Chris. Damien. Chris Chris Rushman. Yeah, sometimes I get messed up on last names. Great at first names, obviously, uh, but it's the last ones. Uh, and that's patreon.com forward slash the Brothers Wisp. You jump in there, you become a patron, we send you an invite to the Slack, and you go bananas in there. You go ham. Uh, it's <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of great discourse, but it's all respectful. Uh, a lot of different channels. Uh, I think we we make a new one probably every week and a half or two weeks, it seems like. I think Mike just made one that's like... Uh, I'm going to say, you guys hear my dogs going bananas in there? Uh, he, Mike just <laughs> made one that's like residential, or no. Uh, yeah, no. Residential electronics, something like that. Consumer electronics. Consumer electronics. There you go. For like your Roku oh, and things CES. like that. So that's good. Uh, a little bit of front matter, uh, which is fancy speak for podcast folks. It means, you know, follow up from last time. Um, it was Michael. De, Michael. How, how do you say it? <laughs> Michael D. Michael DeCharm, I think, something like that. Uh, he was saying that he was watching the IPv6 podcast where we're talking about how there's no default firewall rules in v6. And he says, uh, actually, when you enable the IPv6 package, if you look at the um, system default configuration print, it actually has default rules for IPv6. But the fact is that since they weren't there when it first booted up, you added the package, it's not going to put in there. But if I'm assuming if you add the IPv6 package, um, tell it to reset configuration. Um, it should pull it up in the new default. So there you go. Uh, problem solved. So it's kind of a catch-22 is that they have it off by default because a lot of people aren't going to use it. And, you know, if you have IPv6 enabled, it's it's going to be talking IPv6 to other devices. So they turn it off for security, I would assume, by default. But then because it's off, it doesn't have the default rules. So maybe they need to have some sort of trigger, like when you enable a package, it, you know, it applies its default rules. Yeah. So it at least gives you a base to work from, which I think is nice. So you can system default configuration print once you have the V6 package mm -hmm. enabled and you can see that or just reset. All right. So that's catch up. So we do listen. We actually do take constructive criticism and get better from it. Um, last podcast also, I had mentioned that we had... Uh, Steve's IPv4 v6 network aggregator. It was something he whipped up from Mike. Mike was asking about it, and uh, I had the wrong link in there. So it is the correct link you'll see in the show notes this go around. Um, let's see a little bit of hardware stuff. There was a post saying Cambium's about to start doing outdoor Cat5 um, cable. So I think that's kind of interesting, I guess. Uh, what do you guys think yeah. about that? It uh, and it's it's not like this is no joke cable. It's like 
copper, copper shielding, all kinds of stuff. I I haven't seen actual prices, just seeing the chatter in the Facebook groups. It's something that they're proud of. Uh, it's like a buck a foot. Wow. Um, and they're saying achieving system level ninety nine point. So basically five nines availability. Uh, based it, on this uh, cable, I guess that's their it, way of saying it's not going to fail on you. Yet, uh, and I know that there are vendors out there that make cable like this, and that it's really expensive. Um, I don't know what you know what it actually costs for some of the competitors. Um, Mountain, and they get strikes a lot, so they have to run fiber underground because obviously lightning or electric isn't going to burn up fiber but cat 5 just evaporates <laughs> yet yeah, uh you see and that's that's kind of where i was going to go with this is that like i don't i fail to see the point for making this really expensive really fancy cable when fiber solves the problem okay yeah. like well, i mean like uh, fiber is cheaper yeah. fiber is better it solves the problem why make it i guess you could still <laughs> use where hey miller uh, Miller hey. from Virginia. Say, I'm back. Oh, so. back and better. Um, uh, we were just talking about how Cambium announced they're going to be doing outdoor Cat5 cable that they are super proud of. Another thing I think is interesting is it's Cat5. Why wouldn't they just go straight to Cat6? Um, for whatever reason. But also people, I mean, they POE power their radios, right? So you could, uh, even if you're running fiber up there, I guess you could still use it to power your kit but it seems like in most instances where people are doing uh fiber up they're just running what some kind of romex some kind of power anyway so do we think cambium's gonna do it badly they have a pretty good track record in my opinion of doing things and bringing things to market and doing a good job at it so it's just another example of them trying to maintain control over everything that that you uh have for the wireless link you're doing the wiring and the yeah. and the whole king of boodle so well i see somebody know, it's... here in the comments saying um uh they got burned by the first gen ubiquity uh tough cable stuff yeah. so uh it they makes them a little and it turned green yeah and started cracking and, and just basically <laughs> sloughing off and so a lot of people are they're basically saying you know we're a little gun shy about uh beta testing somebody's new uh cable so maybe we'll just wait and see but I think you're right. Cambium does seem to be kind of the premium, in my mind, I guess, the premium vendor on stuff. And so they don't want to tarnish that reputation. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just curious. Who who would use uh, two things? Who would use this kind of cable aside from people that are just going to be putting it underground? I mean, is there a reason why you would want to use this cable underground as opposed to like what Hammett said, fiber or? Anything else? Oh. I think this is strictly tower cable. Yeah, it's like not oh, up the tower. Yeah. Ah. So it's you're buying a Cambium link and you want to make sure it works and Cambium is not going to say, "Oh, what cable did you use?" Yeah. You know, it's Cambium Cambium cable. You know, it's a complete Cambium solution. So you have to warrant it, you know, Cambium yeah. kind of thing. So that's what I see. That could be interesting. Then they could start uh maybe they start writing that into the warranty information. Hey, if you're not using uh, KBM cable that's going to void something. Not Possibly, to say they would, or just seen, stop them. I've seen stop them from pointing stuff. a finger at the cable at least. You know. Yeah, yeah. One less thing to. Well, <laughs> you say that, but then if they don't install the cable right, you know, and yeah. and then because it is shielded, <laughs> if they don't ground it properly and things like that, then it's gonna. Yeah, the, or you'll terminate it properly, or yeah. you know. Are they? No, are they selling the ends too? The Cat Five ends, the shielded ends. I don't know. Oh, they wow. just made kind of a media announcement about it, so all they've mentioned that I can see is the cable itself. I haven't seen anything about ends. You'd think they would have ends, right? Because um, the end that you choose can make a big difference as well. You know, if you pick the wrong size gauge uh, cable for uh, the end, then yeah, you know. it, yeah, the uh, end as well as um, uh, I've learned that. In the connectors, there are different styles depending on. Uh, Pins. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You know, you know, solid versus they're, stranded cable. They're either straight, or they're it, they're pronged. Pinkled. Yeah, they're yeah. Pronged and they dig in. Yeah. Yeah, there's two or some have three depending on the cable type. Yeah, and then some of them um, have metal shielding on the connector itself, and if that metal is crap, 
then it's going to degrade and fall apart or corrode it, really um, fast. It, um, and uh, if you have Ubiquity in, sometimes not all the pins are actually in the uh, connector. So That could be any manufacturer, though. Come on. Well, <laughs> it could be any. I just haven't had that experience with anybody else. <laughs> By the way, could what's be. that goop that they squirt into the connector? Dielectric grease? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like snot. It's like this thick, goopy snot. By the way, Hammett, oh. thanks for the emoji. I, I love it. <laughs> it wasn't me. I, it has I'm to be. Serious. Only, only, the only person that can create it no, is the I, person I think that it was, started I think it room. was Casey, man. Nope. I think Casey yeah. uh, created that. Uh, yeah, for oh, the Dave like, Awards. There's a, a custom it, emote in there that's uh, colon Dave <laughs> colon. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a, um, what is it, a silo in a farmhouse? Isn't that what we've agreed? It's a, a lighthouse and a big rock. There you go. <laughs> well, it is Dave, so it's not that big. Uh, all right. Oh, but, uh, oh <laughs> snap! And it's black. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Helena Ham basket. <laughs> all right, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, if you go to the customized Slack area, you can actually see who submitted each each new oh. emoji. So you can see who did it. Shit, I thought it was you. Okay, that's cool. I appreciate <laughs> it. I like it. I'm now, like it. since Slack we hear you do. <laughs> <laughs> now for our other slack yes for our other slack that uh, uh yeah i did all of the all of the uh, juvenile uh emojis yeah now yeah. now we've got other people that are uh almost better at being uh juvenile than mike it's uh somewhat unbelievable it's good it's good i don't have to do it all i don't have to carry the whole team then <laughs> All right. So let's see. Uh, the last cast, I talked about my USB boost converter, and then I actually put together a little article and video thing. Uh, and then somebody very fervently reminded me that I need to remind people not to run uh, this with uh, high wattage devices, like so on your laptop. So if you plug it into your laptop, you probably don't want to run your hair dryer off this thing, uh, which is completely understandable. Um, most USB ports on laptops have intelligence for overcurrent protection, so they'll actually just turn the port off. Um, but to his point, yes, absolutely. If you're going to power something <laughs> high wattage, use a USB booster pack, like power pack. Uh, that way, you know, you're isolating your important equipment away from it. Uh, and those booster packs, usually I get the, uh, you know, so it's spitting out five volts. I usually get the two amp guys. And so that's 10 mm -hmm. watts you can run off a port. And a lot of times I'll use a Y cable, like on my light suits and stuff. That way you can utilize both ports. So you're looking at 20 watts you can pull out of these things. So pretty cool there. Uh, let's see. Mike put on here RB4011 1100H X4 BGP. What's the, what's the story on that? <laughs> so that RB4011... Uh, which has the same chip as the um, AH uh, but X4 that would actually be much much better at BGP than the CCR sure. um, because its cores are bigger. Single threaded performance would be faster on a higher CPU gigahertz count. Yeah. Well, well, like you know, not only CCR clock, is wide. This thing is tall, basically. Yeah, the, and yeah. so. Um, kind of put the call out there. Could uh, somebody that has one of these um, check out? Well, if you don't have BGP yourself, uh, check out Greg's blog post he did from the last mum on the whole BGP full route table thing. Um, and time for us, how long it takes for these guys to pull in a full feed? Um, you know, what CPU is like just sitting there. You know, churn absorbing it. internet churn. Uh, I like to see how that performs because that could be a great BGP router if it's if the cheap one's two hundred bucks. Yeah, the, I know the the AHX fours are out there, so somebody could probably do it. The forty elevens, yeah. I think they're supposed to hit distributors what like a, a week, maybe two, something like that. Yeah, it, um, they hit uh, they hit uh, uh, the website, so they should be you know soon, you know weeks one two weeks whatever but yeah so it's 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 the same cpu so yeah. um so somebody please try that out and let us know how long it takes and how well it does at bgp um it'd be quite interesting for microtix flagship bgp router to be of 20 percent of the cost 
of the one that they meant to be the flagship router. I'm just curious. Is I know that it's probably not something that should go in the, uh, you know, like on Microtech's webpage when they do the uh, uh, how many packets per second this thing can do. I mean, would it even be practical to put in, you know, different routing protocols and how fast they can load a table of some sort, like you said, BGP? Is that something you think they should be doing or it's completely not related to how you would benchmark a router? I don't know. Um, I think that's tricky for, I'm going to let Mike finish, but I think that's tricky on a couple of perspectives from them. If they were to put results on BGP convergence time on say like the 4011, I don't think they ever had in mind people pulling BGP tables of, of any, you know, of any real size yeah. on these things. So um, if they did that, if they put BGP results on a 4011, then they're going to get, I think in their minds, a deluge of support calls on people trying to yeah. pull full tables and they're like tipping them yeah. over, you know, so yeah, ah. but not also, all tables are going to be too. the same size. Do they want to sell a whole bunch of these uh, $180 routers that work perfectly in that scenario? Or do they want to sell yeah. the thousand dollar ones? You know, so it's sort of, I don't know, from a marketing perspective, they may not necessarily want people to, you know, be pushed towards that. What what product uh, do you think they're trying to sell here? Is it a home router? I mean, they made the one with the four antennas. All the wireless. It seems yeah. like it's a home, like you got a home router and then you got a Soho router. That's really what it seems to be to me is the two things. And, you know, you don't necessarily take a full table on a Soho router or small yeah, yeah. biz router. So Well, how many Soho Plus, routers have a 10 gig port on them though? Is it a 10 gig? Yeah, there's yeah. one 10 gig and well, so I, I mean that's interesting cuz you would have a 10 gig one 10 gig port and then what would you do with the rest if you have to forward traffic? I mean, you you'd have to like so, fill all of them to get equal throughput. So, like, one of the things I could see is that you have might have an apartment complex and you run 10 gig to each floor and then you have 10 apartments on every floor and you you can give out one gig to every person. Or you're trying okay. to do 10 gig to the apartment and you run fiber to the apartment and you stick this, this router in there with this crazy Wi-Fi in there. It's like 1.7 gigabit Wi-Fi, 802.11ac, so they might be able to get it and you could do link ag or to a desktop computer or something. So, I, you know, I can see some uses for it right away. Um, yeah, but definitely not data center stuff because you know it doesn't have. I well, don't know. Say, say you have well, one power supply. Come on. Well, if you're well, you pick one power. Supply. You could do probably two, two, do two, two. One, one power DC barrel in the back and one POE yeah. in. I don't. I have to look and verify, yeah. but you can I'm pretty. Do that some I'm of pretty sure models. Miller's right. So you can actually get power diversity. And if you're in the data center environment, oh. um, say you're you're getting two redundant connections from your carrier and they're doing VRRP then yeah. all you have is one bridge dinner or two interfaces bridged together with one default route heading out. And that actually would make a yeah. really good data center, very yeah, yeah, redundant that's... data center router. Yeah. That's exactly how I it, do it in my data centers. It, uh, and so then you have the, um, 1100AH, um, X4 that it doesn't have a 10 gig port, but it does have two power supplies. Of, yeah. yeah, it's a you know the you know there. dual AC power supplies. Also got thirteen port on it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, like they kind of just pass through or something, right? It's like a if the model's off, then it'll yeah. get connectivity through it. Yeah, it's it's kind of I don't know if anyone has actually used that in production. As you say, I've never met anybody actually utilizing that feature set. I'm That's sure it's nice there. Failover, sure somebody uses but... it. Yeah, it's nice as a failover, but I've I saw it and I'm like, I'd rather use VRP. Well, I guess if failover. you were doing like uh, what, like a bridged firewall, you know, where it was just kind of bridging through, and then if the device completely failed, then it would just hardware switch it over, and it would pass. I mean, I don't know. Maybe the truth. Just... When does a piece of hardware with two power supplies ever just totally fail? I've never seen that. Well, when the kernel locks. Strike. Lightning strike. Actually, or... then it doesn't turn off if it still has power. I've had an issue with a Microtik that was bricked after an update, after a firmware update, but, and VRP was enabled, and it was all set to fail over, but it didn't, because for some reason, the switching part, the switch chip was still active, but the processor wasn't. It was freaky. So, oh, yeah. Things don't just that die, they like, are halfway dead, and that's the worst scenario. <laughs> it, it, um, I'm looking at uh, router OS memory usage for BGP, 
to see if memory would be a constraint because these only have one gig of RAM. No, they yeah. hold it. Um, yeah, and so on this one CHR I have, um, it has a single uh, full feed, and it's using, with all, with everything it's doing, it's got <laughs> uh, 600 and some odd megs of RAM used. Um, on this other one, I'm looking at Did Mike at just now. admit to using a CCR for BGP? CHR. CHR. Ah. Yeah, get your story straight. That's that's how rumors that's get started. One, that's one where I had say as to what the router is. On this other one, <laughs> where I right. At the, on this other one where I didn't have input, it is a CCR. Um, it's got uh, two gigs of RAM being consumed, but it's got two full feeds and a bunch of IX stuff. In the, the, yeah. And routes full of other stuff hmm. uh, using two. So you 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 probably couldn't use it with a whole bunch of full feeds, but it would it would do one fine. Fair enough. I'm looking looking at mine right now to see what I'm using. <laughs> it's using about it's using about 1.5 gigs right Mine's now. Just if we're comparing Microtix, why don't we just why doesn't someone just get a Max Wave? You know, it's virtualized, but it's MaxWave, yeah. so you get oh, right. a wild ass processor. I got a 1072. It says total memory 11.8 gigabyte gigabytes, and then free memory is 10.3. Okay. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> you know, far superior solution to to a 4011, but it's also not 200 bucks. Yeah. 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 But if you're so holding, other words, you know, we're just if you're holding I, a few hundred routes, think, it'd be good. I think it's a great upgrade for all those people who use 2011s at a tower, mm. for sure. Uh, maybe even 3011s. So. so this so this BGP idea on a 4011 is just like a nice little test to see, or, or some to talk about just to see how far you could push this. Know. How many routes would you would you want to hold in this, Mike? Like 10,000. It's like, is that what you want to see on a test, or you you legitimately want to see what a full feed looks like on it? Well, well, well I mean, if if it takes a full feed faster than a CCR, and if it has lower CPU because of churn than a CCR, then I see no reason why anyone would use a CCR instead of one of well, these. I mean, if you're if you're doing if, Unless they have that many feeds that there's not enough RAM. Well, no, no, no. Or I mean, think about gig ports. Well, think about everything else the router is going to be doing, right? So if you're aggregating a lot of customers, you're doing NAT, you're doing some firewall rules, you're doing all that crap, right? That's going to hit the other CPUs. So if you're doing a CCR, you've got a lot more CPUs to take care of all that other crap. So I don't know. Well, why would you want to do all that in one router? Do less stuff on one router. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mike. We agree on your something. BGP edge <laughs> should only should only be your BGP edge. Yeah. And nothing else. Gotcha. Well, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. Well, I'm not going to argue with it. That's exactly what I do. But uh, a lot of these guys, you know, if if all they can afford is one beefy router, then you know, I mean, they got to do see, everything but, in there. See, but. But now the router is only two hundred bucks instead of a thousand bucks. So now you, so you spend four hundred and get two of them. Yeah, and then and then build a proper architecture. <laughs> Fair enough. How do you do that with only one ten gig port? As you know, one or possibly two, you know, one gig upstreams. You know, still still needs to do BGP, but you know, it's only moving a few hundred meg or you know, maybe a gig or two, but. You know, it's you know, there's there's definitely a need for routers with bigger interfaces. Definitely need for routers bigger than two hundred bucks. I don't know. But I think for do you for a lot of those guys just getting into it? I think you know, I always not wonder that scale. these days. Do you think most ISPs really? I'm talking about like um, eyeball ISPs where they just have subscribers. Do you think they really need full feed, or do they just need North America and then aggregates for European I, stuff? I'll let other people yeah. provide their input, then and then I'll jump in. Well, I was gonna say, like, um, most of what I see is just—I mean, it's like ninety-nine percent here in North America, and very little of it's actually overseas. Anyone else? Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> come on, I, the, let's the, hear your opinion on this because it sounds like he's got a nice little nugget to share with us. <laughs> well, I was gonna. Oh, say, Mike, before you actually say that, Mike, I just want to point out. 
the poster of the pig behind you and you have the same exact skin tone. I just noticed and, that. Now. And hair color. It's really color. weird. And hair color. <laughs> <laughs> and my last and, name is Ham. It's oh, oh snap. <laughs> and you know his ears. Now that he turns his head actually match as well. <laughs> The, the resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> Damn. I think that uh, you got to take your IX uh, um, routes if you have any IXs on your network, for sure. And then... Uh, Which you should. Wonder, yes, you should. And then, like, it, you only really need a transit provider in addition to that. Um, so a default from them is probably the bare minimum that you would need get away with doing it um but i mean full feeds are to, to force traffic out of your network to whichever provider to avoid asymmetric routing and steer traffic to work around bad carriers or yeah. whatever yeah bad paths yeah so if you could get away without those requirements or having to do that then you don't have to take a full feed no yeah or you could get full or, feed and then just filter it right yeah yeah i'm that's what I do. I have the full feed, yeah. and I filter out the majority of it because um, I have a default, and then I have a bunch of IXs. Um, so I only have – I've got uh, my up, my one upstream pixel factory takes pairings with other IXs and uh, content – or carriers, so um, directly. So. Gotcha. And while you're, while you're mentioning – I'm a little weird in my network. So. While you're mentioning uh, BGP and um, default routes – uh, Andrew Thrift was talking about, and I think you um, had run into it before, that if you've got multiple BGP peers and you're getting default from both of them, whichever one is preferred, if you also have a floating static route, right? That's a static yeah. route with a higher administrative distance, so it's unused. If your primary BGP that's giving you default route, if that route fails, instead of using the other BGP default route, it kicks over to your static. And that could be extremely problematic because you really only want that there for like absolute emergencies. If there's, you know, your ISP is providing you one. Um, so just be there's, aware of that. There's also a problem if you use check uh, gateway uh, ping, uh, that can cause a lot of problems. It just doesn't activate ever, even though it might be up. So. I never like that check ping item because the next top is usually alive. It's something a little bit further down that may have a cut. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you could get a false positive. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, let's see. While we're talking about Microtik stuff, I pulled out a few highlights from the Slack. Um, there was so much activity in there. I just kind of scrolled through for a little bit and looked for some stuff. Um, when you're checking CPU resources, something we've just been talking about, uh, don't just look at the CPU utilization in your bar, right? If you have a multi-core device or if it's multi-threaded and it's going to have more than one CPU, well, that, that thing it's showing you up there is an average of all the CPUs. So say you got a 1072 yeah. and you're, you know, you're only showing 3% or 5% or whatever, that could be one core maxed out. So you want to go to system resources, CPU and, <laughs> or system resources. Yeah. Then click the CPU button and it'll show all the procs and one might be getting pegged. So um, if you're having problems and some oddities, be sure to check in there and look at everything. And I think most people nowadays try and um, uh, threshold or rather trend uh, data, you know, like um, uh, like SNMP poll, all of their CPUs, whatever, right? Yeah. Look at all the individual. But ones. also there's another nice little tool in Microtech. It's, uh, I think it's under t uh, tool profile. Is that it? Tool profile or is yep. it system? Yep. No, it's yep. tool profile, and that that's nice because it shows you actually all the different uh, facilities that the Microtech uses. So you can see different you know processes and which processes are bogging you down, not just the CPU itself, but see what's eating that CPU. Yeah. So that's a good idea. Absolutely. So uh, Jeremy was trying to figure out if he had a script running that was eating something up, and he said if you go to System Scripts Jobs, you can see stuff that's actually running. Uh, Ollie hmm. says his 1036 takes about 45 seconds to reboot and start passing traffic. I don't know if he's pulling any feeds or anything, but uh, there's kind of a, a quick how long it takes for something to come up. Because I always forget, you know that moment where you're you're doing an upgrade or you're just having problems, so you reboot it and then you're sweating, waiting for the pings to come back? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. It's usually nice to kind of have a benchmark of how long your device takes so you don't kill yourself in the interim. Uh, Thrift was saying that the Tylera multi-core development environment, which I guess is 
how um, Microtik builds code for those uh, cloud cores, right? The CCRs. Um, it only supports the 3.3 kernel. That's as far as they're going. So uh, Microtik's stuck at the 3.3 kernel. So if there's any features or anything like that that seem to come out for the 3. Dot, or anything beyond the 3.3 kernel, they're not going to be able to take advantage of it. I guess unless what? Would they have to like try and custom write something for that environment, maybe? They'd have to do their own support for it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I think at that point I would just do, you know, I would just Move. leave it behind dump, dump ship. for those. Yeah, like, you know, just be like, okay, well, I mean, you know, definitely not build anything new on that platform. But then it's like, well, sorry, if you want this feature, it's not available on the CCR. The, you know, the, the problem is, so. like, all these people have bought these CCRs. And when if they don't continue to support it, there's going to be all this hardware stuck on version or, well, 6. So... Or, or well, like, like I'm saying, like, you know, not to stop making that, but like, you know what? Okay, so you have a TCR. This is just all you're going to get, because otherwise they have to do kernel I, development, that's pretty and tough. that's like that's pretty tough to tell like your customer base that you're. Yeah, I think that's going to be pitchforks. Uh, if that happens, <laughs> I, uh, I think they've already got pitchforks. It's already been eight years since they came out with the last version well, of Router OS. The only OS. thing that worries me about that, Mike, is there'll be a lot of people that will just keep them. Right, it, it does what they need, um, and they'll, I, I mean they'll have to keep releasing security updates, right? Because what happens well, yeah, if so there's always, a vulnerability always. and they quit releasing yeah. updates? I guess you it's just a, won't get new features. Is that what you think? Yeah, yeah, like you know, it's just a fork. It's like, well, you know, well, you just get version six ninety nine or six hundred and fifty, or you know, you I know, think it's it's, have... it's it's probably the um... I forgot what I was gonna say. Because <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, apparently they've legalized weed in Virginia. <laughs> they have not legalized weed. Well, then you got no Long excuse. Day. No, you got no excuse. You just no, got um, to much at once. I mean, you know, because you know, I can only assume that doing, you know, you are the only person building for a particular architecture. Uh, you know, doing kernel development years ago, like. You know, everybody is still supporting mainframes. It's like, you know, you're just trying to hack stuff to make it work, um, you know, when they stop supporting it. I don't know. I, I don't know if there'd be pitchforks. I think a lot of people would be upset about the CCR being uh, depreciated. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't know where they I go would, from here. Maybe maybe use this. the ARM processors and just focus on those. Um they seem I mean, to be I kind think of they should have done that four years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I don't know if I would cry about it because think of it. I mean, how often do you refresh your routers? I mean, if you're not maxing them out, it should be every four or five years. I would say is pushing it, right? I don't know. That I was mean, the, that so... was the promise of the CCR and Microtik, right? It's like, uh, and the the promise of Microtik in general is you used to be landlocked, like with the traditional vendors, with what you could do because they were using so many hardware ASICs, right? Yeah. Yeah just purpose built for this thing. So you only had so many buffers. You only had so much you could work with, but with Microtik, they just release a new version. You just flash it on there. It's like magic, right? But, uh, did, so along this line, did you guys see that, uh, blog post about this guy who took the edge router and edge router X and loaded, um, BSD on it and, um, WRT on it and did, did performance benchmarks. Mm -mm. You see that? No, nah. did, did he get sued? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. No, I mean, what are they going to do? Sue, sue BSD and uh, for collusion? Sure, <laughs> that's just as much merit uh, as the existing case. Well, if they if they feel like it's uh, him releasing that violates their DRM or whatever, then uh, yeah, maybe he could get sued. I'm going to find that article right now. It's pretty crazy because uh, on the Edge Router X, I think WRT had the best performance. It doing almost 900 and something megabits per second through it, uh, where the, the default stock firmware didn't. So, where's where's Tom Smith when you need to talk about BSD? <laughs> the one time I mean, he's I, all over that. The one time we talk I'm about sure BSD. his ear is ringing. I'm sure his ear is like. <laughs> oh, it's getting hot here. <laughs> it's getting hot. <laughs> Someone's talking about BSD. <laughs> Don't say it three times in a row. We'll be okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'll bust the monitor at us. Was it like Beetlejuice? That kind of action? Yeah. He's just going to appear? <laughs> Bloody Mary or something. Yeah, there you go. It's the worst <laughs> It's the worst thing that could happen. 
Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Jason Wilson uh, shared a screenshot from the Russian mom that had a QR code. So apparently Microtech has an iPhone app now that you can... Yeah, oh, yeah I got it. It's, it's, got pretty, it. it's pretty awesome. And what's, what's really cool about that is that it's pretty much all the features. And you can actually import uh, in, in a WBX file. You know, the you can export your config. So is it basically all your Winbox? Addresses. Yeah, it is, it is Winbox on a phone, and I have it here. And I was just using it this morning because I was too lazy to get out of bed and check something. But there it is. And, dude, it works. It works, and it's wonderful. That's cool. When are we going to do Android? Because I don't do the iPhone thing. This uh, is Android, bro. They did Android about three years ago. Oh. No. Yeah. Three yep. years? Two, two, three years, yeah. I don't know, I just found it a couple of months ago because it popped up in my feed. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want that. I think the iOS one is new, though. Yeah, I guess the iOS oh, one yeah, is new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah, the iOS is definitely new, but Android's been, it's been quite some time. Just quick note, because of all the exploits, uh, Nick Arellano, he, he likes to VPN to, uh, to a, like a VPN concentrator, which all his microtics connect to, and I've done the same thing, and it's been very effective because you really don't open Winbox to the Internet. You're just allowing VPN traffic to access Winbox. Um, but on my phone, I have this app that an SSTP VPN client. So first I connect to the SST, uh, SSTP VPN client, which connects to my you know, CHR microtick in the cloud. And that's where all my microticks connect. And once I'm there, once I'm connected to that, I can open the microtick app and just log straight into a private IP. And it works flawlessly and i love it so it's secure and don't have to worry about getting whacked and i can access it all from my phone so <laughs> says nice. the guy from new york get whacked get whacked <laughs> it, it does it does so uh, on the forum normus made a post july 9th 2015 with a link to the alpha version of the android tick app oh, there you, you go. just like shitting on has my anything day, changed you? with the app since then <laughs> is it still an alpha I uh, it does yeah. I'm not are sure they, it should come in on my code. Are they I had a tick again? app back in fifteen yeah. oh, yeah. in twenty fifteen, but it was crap. It was almost not usable. It kept crashing. Oh yeah. So I don't know. Um uh I was no, always but, uh, leery of the uh the the third parties who would release an app. They'd use the API yeah. or whatever. I'm like, I don't want to provide router information in some third party app that, you know. So uh <laughs> so, so uh you know Dave brings up uh, Nick, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, Arellano. Arellano, Arellano yeah. Um, I always thought he was far away from me. Yeah, so I was like, so that, like, I just realized that. I'm trying to like hire him to do stuff, and he's doing your shit for the next few months. It's like, no, I got work for him to do, and he's doing stuff for you. And, him and, and Dave's already got him booked for months. So I, I, wouldn't, I don't know about for months, but uh, well, that kid is bright, man. Let me tell you, yeah. he's right now still... In his early phases of, I guess, being in the industry, and I've seen him already. He and he doesn't know this, and I keep telling him, I've already seen him surpass some of the big boys, in in the microtech circles, gotcha. so like the big big. So you're boys. trying to take advantage of him while you can, is what you're saying? Young and impressionable. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's how I I'm, heard it. He he needs he needs to realize how smart he is and how, I would say, talented in, in figuring out solutions to problems. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a sharp really kid. Really good at that. Really good kid. That's yeah. why I'm trying to hire him. I know. I already hit him up <laughs> for a, a little bit of help on something, too. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, that kid's going to go places, man. Yeah. All right. So let's see. So um, I guess the lesson of this is that if you're really sharp, uh, come to the Little Brothers and... Um, Get hired you're... away. <laughs> uh, All right. Alex was trying to... You yeah, know, yeah. Alex is, is hiring too out there in uh, California. So. California, yeah, he's trying to pick somebody up, and they do. We're, some we're cool looking stuff. for people too in in Richmond, but uh, you know, that's what it is. Reach out, touch somebody. Yeah. Uh, so Dan discovered one of our one of the the little brothers. He said um, he was having problems with a customer whenever they connected to a Cisco AnyConnect client out somewhere else. Uh, no longer could they access resources properly. And it turns out their AnyConnect was assigning them a new DNS server. So keep that in mind next time. A quick trace route sort of sorted all the problems out. So it's amazing how uh, I think ping and trace route are older than me. 
or maybe almost the same age as me, and yet that's the thing we still go to immediately. Yeah. Fix all the problems. All right, so um, something that was pseudo a uh, a thought project that Thomas, the amazing Unimus Thomas, I'll go ahead and plug Unimus, uh, Unimus.net for your backup solutions for all of your network infrastructure, as well as automated uh, pushing out of things all at once is pretty neat stuff. Check it out. Uh, but he said, at what point does having services separated out bring benefit versus the all-in-one solution, right? And so it, this was kind of birthed from somebody asking, what syslog collector do you use? And so somebody said, like, Graylog. Somebody said uh, they use Kiwi. And then, of course, Thomas chimed in and said, NetXMS, man, it does everything. Um, but to that, I sort of said, yeah, but it comes at a price because NetXMS can be... Um, somewhat obtuse to start with, right? It can it can be a little hard to get off the ground. It, the learning curve is there. It's fairly steep. Yeah. Fairly it's steep. A, it's a, it's a well, and so then also, uh, with with the XMAT syslog, it does it in a MySQL database directly, and, and most tools that are used to working with syslog don't have the database functionality, you know, they're used to flat files and other stuff. So it's not as easy to integrate with other features. So like I'm looking at some of my net XMS syslog stuff. It's like, I have to insert like a splitter to you know, like, like a, a, you know, syslog proxy to say, okay, I'll take all your syslog in, dump some of it out to net XMS, some of it out to this, some of it out to that, because I can't just get it natively from net XMS. But if it's in a database and they have good APIs, I know NetXMS has some good APIs. You should be able to pull it real easily. But if if the tool you're using has that capability, if the other tool. So at the can at the that. core of the question, okay. in your opinions, at what point is there benefit to split out, you know, and use like a specialized solution, you know, versus an all-in-one? Obviously, an all-in-one means it's all together, right? So if you're um, trying to troubleshoot a problem, you've got your trending, you've got your uh, syslog, all of your alerting is sort of all in one place. I mean, I, I can see value in that, right? It's only one server to maintain now, or maybe it gets bigger and you've got to split off the database over here and then you do collectors there, but... Um, I think you just answered the question. <laughs> but but then again, if you get something that just does syslog and it does it mm -hmm. extremely well, right? Maybe, maybe it's going to give you the feature set um, that is best for you, because I'm a big fan of the right tool for the right yeah, job, uh... you know? Get uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Well, you guys were saying earlier, why would you want a router that does everything, where it's doing your firewalling, your natting, and yeah. pulling your BGP, right? You said split it out. So at what point does well, it make sense to split that stuff out? At, uh, no, so, you know, there's, you know, there's definite value because with, uh, uh, you know, having the, you know, single pane with everything integrated, you get certain synergies that you're not going to get otherwise. But then you also give up some of the specializations of the different things, unless you're going to code it in, at which point, it, you know, now you have a UI nightmare. You know, how do you make the one program that does the great overview also give you all the great detail mm. and still be able to drive it? You know, that's kind of where it's like, you know, I like to run a generic network monitoring program you know, program, you know, Libre or NexMS or whatever, in addition to CN Maestro for Cambium and, you know, Air Control for Ubiquity and whatnot, because then they have some of those, you know, vendor-specific things that, you know, you don't always need it, so you don't always use it, but then, you know, you use your main one most of the time, but when you look for something special, let's just go use this other one real quick. Yeah, I think a lot of us, too, have limited... Uh, time you know we have limited engineers on our team and they have limited resources so if you've got one system to maintain i think it's so much easier to take care of than a whole ecosystem full of systems you know maybe if you're if you're a bigger organization it would be easier for you to to do that sort of thing but if you have one system that can kind of do it all then you could focus all of your energy and attention on it maybe that would be a little bit easier I mean, that sounds nice for simplicity and, and ease of management, but I mean, if, if all these different little apps uh, or little monitoring programs or whatever it is that, you know, Hammett said, if they all have good APIs, you can just pull the best parts of that, that info and, and it into an app. Yeah. 
I mean, seriously, that's that's what you would use that for. So, you know, network engineering and and server stuff that's all great, but when it comes to when you get to a certain size, I think you have to start just you know custom scripting. Um, I guess a portal interface to get the info that you need all in one spot, even though it's coming from different uh, programs. Mm. What do you think? I think it's, I mean, I think it's uh, a valid point, uh, but you still have to have a guy that can put all that stuff together, right? Again, yeah, at a certain size, you have to expect that and should prepare for that. I think I'm at that point um, where I really need the guy you guys it sounds like you guys need some of that too i use observium and all my six just log for all my stuff goes there so it's all kind of integrated i get i can make alerts for syslogs or things mm -hmm. and uh so i well my syslog solution's fine for me right now i don't need to go any further but i would like a little bit of more integration between like my call center and our ticketing system and you know, that kind of stuff, and, and the information that they can pull from our knowledge base site and that kind of thing. So yeah. Well, that's that's why vendors make APIs, the, so that yeah. you could address that directly. Yeah. At, at, uh, and so, you know, where I was looking at some of this from is that, you know, I was wanting to, and I've I've done this in areas with principles. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, uh, I haven't actually installed the proxy yet, but I've looked at it and said, okay, I'm going to do that, and then haven't. But, um, you know, I have set up in a smaller scale somewhat of a centralized, uh, partially centralized uh, fail the ban. You know, fail the ban is looking in syslog for huh? login attempts across a variety of boxes. It's not just, you know, watching this one server, watching this one server. Yeah. You know, I have them dumping, you know, you know, they do have their syslog locally, but then they also dump it to this other VM that just does syslog, and then fail to ban watches that, mm. and then performs, you know, actions on the network. You know, it SSHs into a, you know, microtick and, you know, drops a rule on, on the microtick instead of on the server. Um, nice. It just peck in different IPs throughout your range. Um, you know, then you can do you, larger do you, collection. Do you actually have it SSH out and make a like a drop rule, or do you mm -hmm. have it put a null route for that single IP into your infrastructure? I want it to do that. I oh, haven't okay. gotten the time to do that. But yeah, My, like, you know, you know, ideally, I use something like uh, you know, well, like uh, XBGP or something like that to you know dump a, a null route in. You know, that would be ideal. I just Ooh, well, that's, that's been busy. Seems like, it seems like like we need to come up with like some Wisp Docker repository where you just get a Docker image that does this for you. you just point stuff at it, and it's just all set up and ready to go. With a Greg is getting ready. sweaty. To, uh, yeah, Greg is cards. getting sweaty. I think Greg's uh, secret project might be. Oh good. man, no, I gotta do that now. No, that's not. <laughs> oh, but look, Microtech has an awesome API. So <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that, but Microtech has an awesome API. So you can very easily put. You know, like what Mike was saying, doing just, you know, have it dump addresses into a, a, a an address list that already has a rule on the server that says block or whatever. But I'm actually trying to learn PHP and, like you guys said, with what time, which is true, but you got to make time, you know. So, it, it um, I guess on a, a tangent from a tangent from a tangent. Um, so, routing to a black hole was more resource efficient than a standard firewall mm. drop. But since they added the raw rules, yeah. does that change it up, or is it still, yeah, I, I, still I, better raw, than raw? The raw still makes you lose fast path if you use it. Null routes maintain fast path. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, hmm. Understanding of the situation. I didn't even think of that, because I use, I use raw. Originally, uh, I thought that raw maintained fast. I think drift straightened out on that part, but yeah, good it, does, at that. it drops. It, it does drop your fast path when you do that. So. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, let me jump in here because Dave actually uh, 
sorry, Dave's actually got to leave here in a minute, and he had something mm-hmm. he wanted to rant about really quick. What? Uh, yes. What, what, what did it's you a have rant. in mind? All right. So, uh, just recently, the reason why uh, I asked you for data center space is because um, a couple things. Uh, obviously, I need more space. I need better routes than where I'm currently at. But uh, one of the big things is. Um, you know, this whole net neutrality thing, uh, it's not a myth. And it really, net neutrality really is dead, even in California, which is currently blocking it. Um, unfortunately, there's no one at the state level that can enforce that because that's primarily up to the FCC, which is federal. Um, so net neutrality is killed even in California where I am. Uh, and the way I discovered this was... Um, I had a hunch that it could have been that because I've, I've been seeing some really strange results only with customers that were on Verizon slash Frontier Network, whether it be in California or in New York or in Texas. So they, they were all experiencing a, a very strange similar problem, uh, not call quality, but um, a function on the phone that was just not working. So I said, I got to dig in. I got to start, you know, sniffing packets. Which function was at it? My uh, BLFs. So BLFs wouldn't uh, the, the the SIP signal for BLF wouldn't wouldn't uh, get to the phones, that which is, is really odd because that's a layer seven thing. What? Yeah, like, that is oddly specific. It is. It really what is. is. A, what is a BLF? Uh, blink and light function. It uh, um, so it so it like emulates those old basic phone systems where it's like you know each line, you know line one, line two, line three, line four, and you just pushed it and you were there, as opposed to a more enterprise. Um, it, well, phone system like those old like those old like key phone systems versus no, a, I wouldn't say that's exactly enterprise. what it is, but it it does show a presence. Uh, uh, it shows presence on a particular button, so you could program that to, button to be an extension or a feature or something else. But when let's say for example someone's on the phone, their extension light on your phone can go from green to red. So it's not like line one, line two, line three, but it. It's the same idea. I don't want to get into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say was, um, so that's in the SIP header, uh, in the SIP signal, as they call it. And so I was sniffing packets of that leaving my server at the data center. And the same packet I had to catch on the receiving end of the customer's network. And what I found was that signal has been removed. And that sounds like almost like, Uh, what would we call it, Uh, conspiracy theory, but I found the smoking gun because the packet had that mark there, had that signal there when it left my servers, but didn't have that when it arrived at the customer. So that's some odd layer 7 shit. Um, Yeah, and after that, I'm like, this is totally a net neutrality. It it would absolutely work perfectly in any network that was outside of Frontier Verizon, right? Yeah, but that's that wouldn't that that's not a good way to find out if it's that if it's like if that's the real problem so obviously it's the packet sniff checking when it leaves the data center when it arrives at the customer comparing those two packets and seeing what's different um and the real test was to see what happens after i vpn tunnel them to the data center because each one of my cover i'd say 90 percent of my customers have a microtech and so in the microtech, I just created a, a, a an SSTP tunnel, so it looks like you know HTTPS traffic to the ISP. And after I turned that on, like boom, immediately everything was better. The BLS worked. Um, recently, in the last week, I started getting one-way audio, which is usually you see that when you have asymmetric routes, and uh, when you have a problem with your router config, uh, namely with SIP ALG. But I know it wasn't that because I gave a whole presentation on SIP ALG. Um, so <laughs> some people are like, ALG, ALG, turn it off, turn it off. And I'm like, don't even go there, bro. But uh, no, so it wasn't any of those. Occasion. So really hard to track a problem that happens on occasion you're, without having some sort of... You're shoving foot. UDP into a TCP communication stream and that might have something to do with that. I was afraid of that too, but yeah. the nature of VoIP and any real-time protocol that cannot be buffered, i.e. VoIP, you really don't want to use TCP because you don't yeah. ever need to retransmit. But unfortunately, the MicroTik, the only VPNs that MicroTik supports are all TCP. 
um, OVPN, OpenVPN, has a UDP implementation of it, but is not supported by Microtik. So unfortunately, I'm stuck with using TCP. And you know what? Today was the first day I've actually had customers tunneled. Um, I have one large customer that works on a Saturday, and I call them in the morning just to say, hey, how's everything? And obviously, I tested this before I implemented it, but you know, me being nervous about just about everything, I uh, just wanted to call and say, hey, how are the things going over there? And crystal clear, the call quality sounded amazing, actually, uh, which I don't even know. Found it, addressed it, resolved. Don't some headsets or uh, handsets and PBXs support encryption over through SIP, like TLS extensions on top of it they or do, in it? But they do, but there's still... So there's two types of encryption. VoIP can do SIP. Uh, you have your SIP messages, which can be encrypted, and your RTP stream, which can be encrypted. Um, obviously, the RTP if, is way more the, important. The, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, your invites well. and your passwords are going to be stored in SIP head headers. So... Ideally, you want to encrypt both, but here's the yeah. problem. They're still using, SIP is still using the same port number. Uh, and TLS will use like 5061 instead of 5060. Um, obviously, you can make your server listen on any port you want, but the standard is that. So ISPs that are, that deprioritize it or, you know, throttle it or something to screw up the connection. Uh, so even encrypt, it's, it's not a matter of security. It's a matter of getting around uh, the ISPs that are trying to throttle your VoIP connection. That's what it's really my, about. My thought on your specific problem is someone's taking those SIP packets, deconstructing them, pulling out the audio, and putting them back together and saying I'm on the way. That's what. It, if that, that's the only way I could see that flag being left out of that SIP header. You know, I've is if they are completely breaking apart the SIP header and putting it back together and sending it, not not taking into account all the flags that are possible. Only the most popular 90% or so. So I yeah, have the packets. Well, I have the packets to compare. Well, theoretically, <sighs> what makes me wonder is if you do a trace route, it's all going to the same data center infrastructure and it's coming from the same network. So it's very likely that it's going to go from your ISP to the exact same peering point. So it's going to cut through the same router. And I know people before that have had routers to is, really. Is Greg's. Greg's been doing that the whole time, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm having problems. Like all of my machines keep kind of zip zapping. Sorry about that. Net neutrality. Screw it. <laughs> no, but I, I've seen before. So if you take the same trace route, it's gonna, it's probably gonna hit the same peering point to get into Verizon Frontier's network. And then I've heard of people before having high end routers, like big carrier grade routers, just do weird things to packets where they just flip a bit like in a very specific type of packet for whatever reason it would flip a bit and it could just be they were having problems on that same you know because it was it, it's and, and i'm saying i can't say with any certainty but it's most likely that it's going to be going in and out of that same peering point and maybe for whatever reason what? that router has a bug and it's just flipping that bit you know what if one of the routers in between those two endpoints has sip L L alg implemented on it poorly no. And no. it's not supposed to be running, and it's rewriting the packet on the fly. Impossible. Impossible, because SIP ALG only applies to NAT. Only applies if it's to a, NAT. If it's a poor implementation? No. It okay. only applies when NAT is turned on. So, And packets are being translated. Do That's you, where ALG Are you goes. sure all the carriers in between you and them don't have NAT turned on? Oh, God. I'm, I, I'm just going to say absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going from your data I mean, center to, to like tier one carriers, right? So... It seems unlikely yeah, they're, they're like be a, doing that. It's like FIOS oh, but, Verizon but, kind of thing. It uh, so. well, like uh, you know, there uh, some of the major, you know, major broadband providers are doing CG NAT. It's not to say that you know yours is in your case, but in many areas, you know, they are doing CG NAT. I don't even um, know what CG NAT is. Grade. What the hell? Oh, okay. That and it does a lot more, you know, carrier features and things was just basic well, net but hold on if it was let's let's assume crazy that yeah they are using alg don't know why it is a layer seven thing alg so um let's just assume that they are using that why alg is designed to change addresses uh layer seven uh, addresses that are in the layer seven information like sdp and rtp headers um it's designed to change those from the whatever your nat address is to whatever your public address is it wouldn't even go near any of the stuff that I was experiencing. 
So Un unless it was actually rewriting the packets from the public IP to the public IP mistakenly, not supposed to be doing that. Then you'd get one-way audio. But it why would broken. it remove? A well, the packet, BLS the signal. packet would, the packet would go through the router and maintain the same IP information. It would be the exact same header. It would just be. I mean, the I don't know how to answer same. that. I really don't know how to answer that, but I think it's highly unlikely. So I would now, do I would do a trace route from all those customers, all those affected customers to your data center and see what the common point is. Wherever that common point is, contact that carrier and say, look, I've got packet captures, bro, where things change as soon as it hops through this router. Right? You're Not right. Not necessarily that you it will. Know, but... You know that I've already spoken about that in the past, how um, in Southern California, as far as I know, uh, only has one peer that they pushed traffic through i'm sorry frontier only pushes traffic through one peer uh in southern california uh hammett actually showed me this uh, atlas project where we put in the as of frontier down here in uh, socal southern cal and we found the as number plugged into atlas and it showed that it had like i think what was it two or three peers that they have but they only... get uh, yeah some at&t and then they are peered with some people on uh, any two uh, core sites, any two exchange uh, down in LA, but I didn't find very many of those paths that that, yeah. that use that. And they must prefer somehow the the peer to level three because I've never seen traffic um, from Southern Cal that anyone's on Frontier of Horizon ever traverse anywhere other than uh, level three. Well, sure, so, yeah. Because, because it's, you know, because if if your data center isn't on the any two exchange, and they're probably not using AT and T for an upstream, because that would be ridiculous. Yeah, they're expensive. So, yeah. so then level three it is. Yeah. You sure they're not using level three for their their VoIP carrier, their their phone lines support? Like there's, because level three is a major yeah, provider they are, of VoIP. Yeah, my DIDs with them. Um, Look, any, like I said, anything is really possible, but I, I am going to, I'm strongly leaning towards the side of this whole net neutrality being screwed because the whole reason why it started was the big boys got angry, you know, market share away from them, i.e. Netflix, Hulu. Um, they're like, well, we can't have this. We have to lock you guys into our garbage and force you to buy it. And if not, we have to charge you or throttle you down your crap so you can't watch Netflix or make it excruciatingly painful to watch anything other than, you know, the, the carrier's uh, stuff. So I think it goes in line with that. You know what? This also makes me think of, <clears throat> I know an ISP, I think it was in Dallas, something like that. One of my customers was cutting through them. Anyway, they turned up a new peer and uh, for whatever reason... Uh, they hadn't integrated into their IDS, and it started selectively eating uh, VPN packets. Like, it was a very oh. specific type of VPN packet it started eating. Um, so, it was really was odd. It an MTU and thing, I had was to it? start, I mean, I had to, like, supply all kinds of evidence to these guys. Uh, and they were like, oh, yep, my bad, we fixed it. Um, but it makes <laughs> me wonder if... You got to do their job. Could it be, I mean, could it be something like that? You know, because it was I, looking at layer seven and pulling out like very specific. Ooh, I don't like this one. Yeah. Tossing it in the trash. Very specific, you know, very, very specific. So like I said, anything is possible. I, I'm not convinced that it's anything other than net neutrality. I am so curious why Hammett hasn't chimed in at well, all. Well, that's interesting. I'm so your, your packets <laughs> actually made it. They were just that bit was turned off in the packet that arrived. Yeah. The signal was not there. That's interesting because in the the IDS situation, the packets were gone. It was, it was yanking the. I mean, it well, was pulling would, yeah, those out, like, but yeah. it wasn't actually manipulating them. Hmm. What was it? I think we spoke about not too long ago a certain protocol that when it drops a packet, it doesn't even send an ICMP response. So it just disappears, and you don't even have any uh -oh. notification well, if you, of it. If you some... violate layer two MTU, that's what it does. It just disappears in oh. the ether. Oh, okay. It, um, on a somewhat of a tangent, uh, I knew that, that, that some companies did, so I was trying to find it. Uh, Sangoma phones have a built-in IPsec client on, on the VoIP phone itself. Um, 
I don't know how widespread that is in the industry. I know it's, it's not. A, it, there's there's a lot of encryption built into a lot of these handsets now. I know uh, Polycom Wait. has it in some of the latest models. Oma is IPsec. Yeah, so, yeah, because I haven't seen it in other phones. Um, you know, there's a, there's a ton of phones out there. Um, you know, and I like to work with the, the phones that I, I that just work well and work great with uh, configuring and auto-provisioning. So I'm, I'm not an expert on every phone out there, but I've never seen anything like what you just described. Uh, it would be nice. That would be really nice. I think that's something that has to be implemented uh, shortly because of what's going on with net neutrality. Wouldn't be a bad idea. I'm going to keep saying that until Mike just explodes. <laughs> Come on, Mike. Where well, is all right, he? All right. I'm so waiting for it, man. He's it's got... going to be two weeks before our next podcast. You're going to do more research. You're going to be beating up the carriers. So I wonder oh, yeah. I wonder if you're going to hear anything back in the uh, in the interim. I'm the type of guy that just likes to handle things myself. You know it's nearly impossible. Yeah, yeah you do. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's nearly <laughs> in full of fixing a problem myself. I know one thing. I don't like to depend on others for critical things. You know, I don't need to know everything, but I need to know enough on some areas to get things done in some sort of fashion. Um, but I'm not going to call level three because you know how that's going to No, you, what you have to do is you have to white paper them to death. You really have to have all of your evidence together. But I, I do it semi-regularly and... You get results. It takes time, though. Yeah. So, I've David, business by the time. Yeah. You, you said that uh, Microtech doesn't support any VPNs that aren't UDP. IPsec is not UDP or TCP. Have you tried IPsec tunnel mode or anything like that? Um, no, I haven't. I wanted something quick and simple. Quick, simple. Uh, I don't want to have like two handshakes for every single VPN that goes out. Yeah. IPsec is great, but you know what? It, right now, the ISP see it as web traffic. Yeah. You know, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> but I don't, I, I would prefer well, not to use they, a they, they They see the stream, and they can identify the stream as being VoIP because it's a constant 80K stream. I, I thought and, the same thing. You can, you can actually do a lot of, like, white paper, like, there's probably a lot of security papers out there on how you can actually pull out the information oh, that's in the call. I thought the same thing, but I don't know. I was talking to Nick about it, and he's like, I don't know if the ISPs are going to go that far, you know, well, to actually even look at then, the Even if they, I mean, they see it on port 80, but it's probably going to, if you look at the packets, you can probably. Port 443. Oh, yeah, 443. Yeah. If you look at the packets, you can probably identify that it is SSTP traffic. But then in that respect, they'll just assume that it's. VPN traffic to your corporate headquarters yeah. or something. And and plus, it won't be 88K, 80 head per uh, packet. So just just turn on BFD as well. That'll add a little bit extra. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could use different codecs or, too. But yeah. You're going to run a ping through, just the pad at 64K or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. But well, you know what? So far, it's working. I'm happy, you know crisis uh, averted or dealt with right. so i'm okay in that well, respect i, I but... have some decent contacts in level three so if you want to if you want to pursue this further uh we can go down that mm -hmm. rabbit hole it's a... don't give a shit <laughs> I, I i i solved it <laughs> so... no you you put a band-aid on it um i wouldn't call that a band-aid it works <laughs> stuck your finger in the it dike works. hopefully uh hopefully it doesn't start splintering somewhere else that you can't reach <laughs> Well, oh, nobody's going to hit that softball. All right, good deal. I was about to, but remember we had the conversation about that's how right, I have professionalism. To like... I'm so proud of you. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you're okay. growing. All right, good deal. It, uh, it, it, uh, <laughs> there's some definite grins. Uh, uh... Dinguses. Oh, uh, I regretted man. it the second I said it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good times. All right, so uh, due to my internet cutting out every 15 minutes or whatever it happens to be and that's driving me crazy because i'm gonna have to go back and do like 50 edits to chop this uh i said we stick a fork in it you guys good with that almost almost yeah i think uh you should totally like you know sniff the packets on your skype and see if it's your internet or skype and then call the isp and tell them that hey you're screwing this have your white papers well, ready. I, I do a backup <laughs> recording right over here with another laptop and i'm seeing them both freeze simultaneously so it is my upstream is uh 
having problems. <laughs> Imagine that. But, uh, um, before we call it a day, I did want to say that before before we meet again, uh, Wispapalooza will have happened. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to be there. Mike will be there. I'll Who be in there. Oh, nice. I, I All right. fly in on Sunday around 8, and I fly out Friday at 11.30 p.m. Red Eye, so... Damn. I'll be there all week. Yeah. All right, so I'm driving. Are you guys going to... So I know before we used to do it in just the our private Slack, um, but in the, the Little Brothers with Slack, are you going to start a channel just for Vegas so all the guys there can coordinate together? Yeah, yeah we should it's, just do it there, not uh, anywhere else, because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah that but, way yeah. Like, get uh, any, yeah. any of the listeners it's, that uh, happen to be there on the Slack, everybody can yeah. coordinate where everybody's at all at the same time. That'll be cool. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, I just made the conferences channel that way we don't. Yeah. Was was you know, yeah. Conferences. Yeah. Generic. Conferences and call it a day. All right, easy peasy. All right. Uh, let's see. So, Dave from Pennington, if people are going to get a hold of you out on the internet, how are they going to do that? Uh, just send me an email, David at Pennytone dot com. All right. In all of your thoughts and questions and comments about net neutrality, you shoot those over to Dave. <laughs> Uh, Mikey, <laughs> carbon copy, Mike. <laughs> Mikey, if people want to get a hold of you out on the internet, how do they do that? Uh, I'm I'm busy. Leave me alone. All right, he's busy. So that would be facebookcom forward slash the brothers west. That's where Mike's at. Uh, Miller, if people Ew. are going to get a hold of you, if you want people to get a hold of you, how do they do that? He, he Little brother Slack channel. Yeah, well, Slack channel is the easiest way. I mean, I'm always on that. Uh, always looking at that. Uh, I had one of the uh, I had one of the little brothers send me an email and I replied on Slack and he was like, "What the hell, dude?" <laughs> and my response was, "It's the closest thing to uh, constant communication or, or real time communication I can do on the Slack, so I like that too." Um, yeah. If you want to find, well, also Miller, you got a blog. Plug the blog. Dynstatic.net, which I haven't updated in a long time. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oldie yeah. but goodie. D-Y-N-S-T-A-T-I-C.net. Mostly observium uh, setup guides that are pretty old, but uh, Is that the last thing you've posted. Uh, the last thing I posted was about Unimus being released, but uh, so it's been a while. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, so you know, you so actually I see... need to go to my blog to see the, the observium setup stuff because observe the guys at observium asked me if they could rip my information, my my steps, and put it on their site. And I give them approval to do so. So yeah, yeah, you uh... can just go and get it there too. So. Yet uh, back when I set up, uh, uh, set up, at, set up and Observium VM, yeah. uh, I I used yours versus the official because it was it was it was better. Teen, uh, yeah. 2014. Yeah, it, I I I basically did those at work, um. So I've been really busy since then. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a couple of topics that I've been meaning to do. I was gonna do one on like my home lab stuff that I do. Um, you know the servers that I build at the house. All that fun stuff. No. That's right. That's right. Uh, you in the Slack, you have a channel. Yeah, pretty much. made a home lab. Yeah, channel home now. lab channel. Just talking about tons of stuff in there. The Dell R510 server that I just built with the five 12 terabyte drives and ZFS, Open Media Vault, Docker, build stuff like that. Fun that's stuff. Killer man. All right. If you want to get a hold of me, gregsoul.com. Um, email me, greg at gregsoul.com. I do some stuff on occasion. Um, also, the Slack. Again, we'll pump it. Patreon, Patreon.com forward slash the Brothers Wisp. Jump in there. Get on the Slack. It's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of good information flowing back and forth. Uh, again, question comments. Facebook.com forward slash the Brothers Wisp. Uh, you can also hit us at contact us at the Brothers Wisp.com if you're old school email style. Um, yeah. Anything you guys run into, uh, I think it's, it's good commentary. It's good fodder for this stuff I, I love just looking at the slack and talking about one thing somebody happened and it turns into a 15 minute conversation uh, I love that for conversation starters right because there's 10 ways to skin the cat and everybody in the slack has done it a different way so I, I really enjoy that so 
Uh, questions, comments, keep them coming. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next time. and start learning. Lighting up the tower so people can start searching. Shooting up the web and neighborhoods, net surfing. We got horrible jokes, we're loud and annoying. But we're informative facts, we're not disappointing. Just give us a listen, cause fun is the mission. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry, you're forgiven.